This video is brought to you by Slate Black Industries. For grip panels and other accessories, visit slateblackindustries.com. When most people think of primary arms optics, their mind goes to one of the numerous budget-conscious options that PA is known for, not something north of $1,000. But on this episode of Nine Hole Reviews, we're going to answer the question, how good are the primary arms platinum series of optics actually? We're looking at the PLX 1-8x24 low power variable optic to see how it stacks up against the name brands we're used to seeing in this price range. As usual, we'll be looking at the relevant features we see as being required for a quality LPVO. Clarity, eye box, field of view, reticle illumination, and so on. The qualities which lend to speed up close, identification as the range begins to extend, and all possible advantages when shooting at range targets. So let's start by taking a look down the PLX 1-8. to As you can see straight away, any concerns about glass quality can be put to bed. The glass here is on par with other premium optics. Think Vortex Razor, Night Force NX8, Accupower 1-8. Light transmission feels very good, as we'd anticipate out of the beefy 34mm tube, and the overall image comes through very well. We aren't detecting any hues or discolorations in the glass. When we start to look at the field of view, you'll notice that things are on the tighter side here at 1 power, with a field of view of 106 feet at 100 yards. Now that's in line with what you get out of the much smaller and lighter NX8 from Night Force, and worse than the 1-8 to AccuPower and 1-6 to Razor. That said, when we push up to 8-power, things align very much with what we've been seeing out of other 8-power optics right at about the 13-foot mark. So nothing to write home about in the field of view category, but nothing crippling either. It, it's still larger than the 8-tack or 1-8 to at 1-power after all. Next, let's consider the eye box. How precise does the shooter's head need to be behind the optic to avoid seeing that nasty scope shadow? Well, moderately precise is the answer here. On one power, there's a decent amount of forgiveness, making getting on and off the optic simple enough. There's enough forgiveness that you won't be seeing shadow during transitions or recoil or anything of that sort. As we crank up to 8 power, things get more specific, as you'd expect. In an attempt to quantify the eye box overall, we'd say it's maybe slightly tighter than the AccuPower 1 to 8, but it's certainly better than the NX8. And now we get into one of the main reasons you'd really consider this optic over its direct competition, and that's the reticle. We decided to go with the Griffin Mill variant, which we believe leverages the best aspects of the ACSS's capabilities while maintaining the use of a mill grid as opposed to a BDC, meaning you can A, use whatever zero you want and still get the full use out of your holdover feature, B, work more efficiently with a spotter in terms of making adjustments, and C, make more precise firing solutions in general over a simple BDC. Let's hit some of the obvious high points now. First is the infinite aiming point. The chevron tip allows for a finite aiming point that will never obscure the target as range extends. When you consider that this optic has the option to unlock the turret and dial, this is a big win in our eyes. Contrast that against some other reticles that obscure much of the target at range, and you can see the value here. Now, onto the ranging features. First, you have an easy full target height ranging feature on the left and right of the outer donut. This is for top of the target's head to the target's feet. Bracket and use the ranging feature according to the numbers listed for 100 yards ranging increments. Then on the mill stadia, you have the ACSS shoulder to shoulder ranging tool. The base of the chevron, when hitting tip to tip on the target's shoulders, denotes 300 yards, and then the subsequent stadia represent increasing increments of 100 yards, maxing at target ranging of 600. Just below the 600 yard ranging stadia, which is the fourth full mill marker, you'll notice a barbell style stadia. This represents the fifth mill and is true for every five mills in this reticle, making large incremental jumps in the optic a bit easier. You also have the numeric designations out to the side of the grid for added benefit. 
It's worth noting that because this reticle allows you to choose your own zero distance, the ranging hashes won't necessarily match up exactly with your mill holds at various ranges, depending on the combination of firearm, cartridge, and zero you choose to run. For example, the specific rifle we tested this optic on, our Lone Star Armory 16-inch MPC, has a very fast barrel. So the trajectory out to about 400 yards while using a 200 yard zero is quite flat. We're only holding about 1.5 mils of elevation at 400, despite the ranging hash being at the two mil mark. Now, as a general rule though, most 5.56 guns zeroed around 200 yards will carry through a two mil comp at 400, three mil at 500, and four mil at 600, coinciding with the ranging markers. Lastly, the reticle maintains the ACSS mover leading point to the left and right of the chevron. These are the holding positions for targets at a run with a firearm. There are a few other little cool hidden features and tricks in the Griffin Mill. Now, we don't want to get too far into the weeds, but one of the items you can observe is how the mill numeric designators line up not only with the elevation marker, but also with the windage markers for the whole grid. For example, your numeric number two lines up with the plus two mil elevation marker, as well as the plus two left or plus two right windage markers. A little value adds that most people might not even notice until they're out in the field gaining exposure and experience with this optic and reticle. So what happens when we dial this optic back to one power? Obviously, it's a first focal plane reticle, so how does the reticle stack up there? Well, unlike some of the other ACSS reticles we've looked at that have felt just a touch too small at one power, the donut on the Griffin feels perfect. Big enough not to get lost when aiming at targets, including those a bit further out between 25 and 75 yards or so, and certainly sufficient for one power use. Ultimately, I still tend to prefer large thick stadia to draw my eye into the reticle center and or to bracket targets, but that's purely a matter of personal preference. And what about the illumination? Well, it's better than any other primary arms optics we've looked through in terms of securing a vibrant reticle, especially on one power, but it's still not the best. There is some inconsistency or fuzziness or bleeding in the illumination, all of which are not optimal. It's worth mentioning that this is not untrue of other optics, even in and around this price range, so it's just a consideration. While it scrapes by as being something we would call daylight visible, it doesn't carry through any significant vibrance. Now, illumination is controlled by a knob on the left of the optic body, which has off positions between settings, but does not lock. Conversely, the turrets, which are exposed, do have a full lockdown feature. The lock works very well and basically gives the user the best of both worlds between the security of a capped turret and also being able to dial should the need arise. We tend to leave the turret set without dialing for most applications with this style optic, but the 0.1 mil adjustments here allow for fine-tuned zeroing, which is a definitive bonus. A quick note on power adjustment. All in all, the power adjustment on this optic is certainly acceptable without the use of a throat lever, but ultimately would be improved with the inclusion of such a device. We're finding that this is generally our feeling for most LPVOs that don't ship with the throw lever. That said, the Primary Arms Platinum definitely is easier to actuate than some of the others that we have been testing. Lastly, let's talk about footprint. The weight on the PLX 1 to 8 is certainly not one of its finer points, coming in just shy of 27 ounces. For an LPVO, this is on the very heavy side of things being more than the Attacker, AccuPower, Voodoo 1-8, Burris XTR, Vortex 1-10, and so on. Without the use of a lightweight mount, we were really feeling the difference here, especially when swapping between optics for testing. So consider that the PLX sacrifices on the footprint in order to hit some other performance characteristics. If it's any consolation, it does feel like an absolute tank. So overall, how does the Primary Arms PLX 1-8 stack up? Well, the glass is up there with other optics in the same price range, the reticle is bonkers for use at distance and acceptable for use on one power, the eye box is equally acceptable and while not gigantic, isn't going to be a noticeable point of negativity for most users. 
Illumination and Weight are the weakest areas, but both can be overcome depending upon the user's intended application for the optic. So does this optic stack up to its competition? Oh yes. And depending on which feature set is the most important to you, may very well exceed it. We hope you enjoyed this take on the PLX 1-8, and until next time, we'll see you on the range. Seven one six is Bill Knight six four Vic eight pack red con one green green top copy over. Bill Knight six this is seven one six Roger over. One six Bill Knight one one pack green green over. This is seven one six Roger over. One six Bill Knight two one Victor two packs red con one.